start by just framing this panel a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that plague the system, so not just individual pieces of early childhood education or K through 5, but when we really zoom out and look at how all the pieces fit together, what's working, what's not, and what do we do. So just some thoughts to start us off. People have been trying to fix our education system since we started educating other people. And it's always been a system in service of our nation. It's been tasked with driving economic growth, with moral conditioning, social norms, and achieving some sense of national unity. But access to education has varied as our national history has ascribed different worthiness values to different demographics. First, it was only wealthy, elite white men then eventually white men and white women, and then finally to all races and all socioeconomic brackets. But as we've heard today, technical access doesn't mean consistency. And while we've promised a fair system, we've under-delivered on that promise. Today, the problems that plague our nation over the next few decades stem from the cumulative and simultaneous deterioration of the fitness of our national operating systems, systems like education, energy, healthcare, food, and governance. We're witnessing what happens when software designed to run on a PC is patched to try and run on an iPhone. When we drill down to opportunities our government, per its current structure, has to quote unquote shape a nation, among the most obvious levers to pull is in our national method for shaping our populace, our education system. But from curriculum to teaching practices to time spent in school to testing and standards, our education system has always flowed from the top down. So my questions today really stem around why we see most attempts at reform happening from the bottom up or the outside in. If we build it, it being something better, will they come? I think things start with knowing what good looks like across stakeholder groups, across categories of infrastructure types. In order to get from here to this mythical there of where we need to be, we have to know what success looks like for an education system that's supposed to operate in the context of this innovation economy. So today I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and their work to you. They'll reflect on how the stakeholders, advances, and indicators relevant to their points of view fit into their conceptualizations of what success looks like for educating people today in service of tomorrow and beyond. So to kick us off, Dexter, I'm gonna just go down the line and let you introduce yourself, and we'll go from there. Should I sit or, I don't know, I'll stand because I can't see you. I don't know if you want to see me, but that's. Uh, okay, so the, the topic of this thing is, uh, or I guess I'm not, I'm just supposed to tell who I am. Yeah, who you are, uh, what you do, would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, the Department of Defense gives me this nice little tag, it has my name on it, so it's, uh, that's always very helpful. Uh, my name is Dexter Fletcher, I work for something called the Institute for Defense Analyses. Our job is to provide, uh, uh, I guess, uh, analyses and research on uh, technical and scientific matters for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, these matters sometimes include uh, the, uh, education and training, uh, although albeit somewhat reluctantly because they want to talk about bombs and IEDs and good things like that. Uh, my background is uh, in uh, my, my, well, my undergraduate major was English. I want to make it a point of that uh, because I decided I didn't want to make, uh, uh, spend my life uh, asking people to want fries for that, so I got a master's in computer science and then went on and got my doctorate in psychology. So, so. Did you get a PhD? Yes, ma'am. In, oh, in good. psychology, that was that was my doctorate. I was just business. checking, just That's making sure. <laughs> All right, Jay, you're up. All right, I, now I feel like I have to stand. <laughs> I'm gonna sit. No, you can sit. Uh, okay, my name is Jay Phelan, and I have been a biology instructor here at UCLA for the last 20 years, and I'm part of a group called the Life Sciences Core Curriculum, and this is a. Uh, curriculum that students take no matter what their life science major is going to be. So they all start with these intro classes and then they move on uh, outside. So what that means is that all of my teaching, which I teach every quarter, uh, involves classes of maybe 300, 350 students and, and all the challenges that go along with that. I uh, also write textbooks for non-science students. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I've been doing that for a while, and, and sort of as my, my side hobby, but something that I'm very interested in, is, is I created an adaptive quizzing platform to, to help my students when they kept asking me, give us more practice problems, give us more practice problems, and I got tired of taping old exams outside my office, <laughs> and so that, that's how I, I 
got into that. So uh, my, my background was I was originally a student here at UCLA, and, and I, I will say this, I was a terrible, terrible student and, and <laughs> almost, almost flunked out. I'll tell my students I know what uh, academic probation is, I know what subject <laughs> to dismissal is, and, and I think a lot about that. I was embarrassed about it for many years. I still kind of am. But it took a long time before I, I realized the issues uh, that factored into why my classes weren't speaking to me. <laughs> and ultimately, I was able to, to recover and then go on for, for a master's and PhD in biology. Good. Bootsy? Yep. Um, my name is Bootsy Battleholt. I am a math teacher at Marina Del Rey Middle School. Um, we are an LAUSD school, uh, even though Marina Del Rey sounds very fancy. We have uh, half of our students come on buses from all over Los Angeles, and the other half walk over from uh, some housing projects, Mar, Mar Vista Gardens, which are just a little bit to the east of us. So we are um, a Title I school. Every student there gets a free lunch. Um, my background is that, uh, well, I've been teaching math for uh, eight years at Marina and a, a couple years in elementary before that. Um, but also, I've uh, more recently done a policy fellow fellowship, an education policy fellowship, which has uh, provided many opportunities to speak to uh, stakeholders across, um, across education. Um, done a lot of speaking to <coughs> folks about assessment. Um, in particular, um, I facilitated a group of about 100 teachers from across Los Angeles to examine uh, the Smarter Balanced Assessment and really give uh, you know, a, a boots on the ground sort of uh, perspective of what they, they felt the assessment provided for our students. Um, also, I've, uh, I've got to plug my, my uh, conversation with, <laughs> with President Obama um, about assessment as well. Um, when he was really interested during the drafting of ESSA, uh, very much interested in how uh, what we are uh, doing with assessment should be changed or, or not. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Perfect, thanks. Don, you're up. Yeah, I think I'm gonna add a little bit more about her. She was also teacher of the year, uh, <laughs> which should uh, not go unstated. Uh, amazing educator uh, on, on the stage here. Don Wilson, I'm currently the superintendent of Vista Charter Public Schools. That's a very new gig for me, uh, first year. Uh, but leading up to that, I was in the classroom for 17 years. I taught for 17 years, at which time I then went into administration, uh, assistant principal, principal at Wonderland Avenue uh, Elementary, where I was able to work with both a magnet school, uh, gifted population, and then the home school. Uh, after that, I was a director for pilot school project for LAUSD, uh, working with a variety of the pilot schools uh, in, which is a public school attempt to really look at how charter, the charter freedoms that you have in the charter and the autonomies might work within a public school system. Uh, after that, I was director of Link Learning, uh, which is a program that really tries to meld both college and career readiness in pathway preparation. There's a long explanation there as well. And then all of that led me to my current uh, opportunity to really lead a, a district uh, doing the kinds of things that I've learned really work with students. And so actually I'm finding myself uh, probably the most exciting point of my life, uh, being able to have the freedom, the autonomy to, to do the things that we know are right. Awesome, so I'll field a few questions and whoever wants to take them can take them and then we'll open it up for more of a Q&A. So to start off, many of you emailed me kind of talking about students and the challenges that your students, your primary stakeholder face. As you think about the piece of the system that you've bitten off in the context of all of the challenges that we heard about this morning, if you could wave a magic wand and kind of start afresh or change something and make it go away, whoever that evil enemy to you actually is, help us understand how you would go about rewiring things or what one line of code you would change to make the operating system work better. Well, I, I, or I've been pushing this for hundreds of years, so I, I hate to bring it up, but there's this matter of individualization, which we now call personalization in education. Uh, I think it was Thorndike 150 years ago who said that this is the major problem that uh, classroom instruction faces. 
uh, 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 and of course it's carried on by one of my mentors, Pat Soupies, who I, uh, uh, who I just thought was wonderful and worked with very closely. Uh, that, that, so this gets around to classroom education. So what, what is the difference between your fastest learners and your slowest learners? Uh, there was a wonderful paper many, many years ago by Gettner out of the uh, University of Wisconsin. And uh, she, she reviewed a number of studies of this, looking at the fastest versus the slowest. The, 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 overall, there is agreement that the uh, difference is a factor of four. That is to say, in any classroom, you're going to have a kid. You're going to have kids who are bored out of their heads, and other kids who are totally lost. Uh, and, and if you got a classroom full of 26.5 students, uh, I don't know what that last student looks like, but all right, 25.65 students. Uh, you're, you, you know, a single teacher has to deal with all that variety, all those, in addition to, uh, you know, their learning capabilities, they have to deal with their home capabilities, which, we, you know, we, we heard a lot about today. Uh, uh, it's, it's just impossible. It can't be done in a classroom, I would claim. If we, we can have arguments about that, you have to use technology. Uh, you need a tutor, an individual tutor for every student. Okay, well, you can't afford that, all right. What can you afford? You can afford a computer. When we first started, we couldn't. We can now, and that's really the argument. It's not because we're enamored of computers or technology or anything like that. It's the fact that we can deal with each student as an individual. Can't do it for everything. You know, there's some things that you must have a, a human teacher there dealing with a human uh, learner. But for many things, uh, it, it, it works, the, the technology works well. So that's, that's, a, that's a point that's been going through my head for a long, long time, even now working for the Department of Defense. I concur. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> one other thing, uh, I, I, I like the idea of 26 and a half students when, when I've got you know, more than an order of magnitude, more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the same issue, that you look at the students and you want to know what's going on in, in your head. Because uh, many of us have probably had that situation where I'll have someone in a class and you see them and they sit there day after day. And from, from their affect, you think they, they hate me, they feel like I'm wasting their time, they are bored or they're confused or whatever. It's hard for me to imagine what's going on in their head. And, and sometimes I find myself talking faster and faster and trying to be more creative and use better analogies because I have to get to them somehow. And one day I'll be walking away and I'll catch up to them or something and they'll look over and I'm like, wow, this is it. This is where they lay into me. And they'll say, I gotta tell you, your class is changing my life. <laughs> and you're like, really? And, and you don't know that. And so that's where the technology comes in for me is, is that it's the outside of classroom window into their brains. I want to know where they are, what have they done, what are their patterns of, of study. So for instance, one really trivial thing, but that I've thought about a lot, is that with uh, this adaptive quizzing engine I created, I can see when the students are, are using it, when they're, they're answering. Even uh, I'll, in some of my classes, there will be no credit for it, but it's just a place to practice. And I put a little counter on the site so that it was like a gas pump and I could, I could watch it. And I saw the night before the exam, sometimes two nights before the exam, they were going crazy. They were choosing uh, this limited valuable time then, and that's when they wanted to, to rehearse their knowledge. They wanted practice. And I'd look at the, the, their activity over the term, and it would be nothing. So in my mind, I thought, oh, they're always doing a little, and then they bump it up. No, they're doing nothing. And then this spike, and I'd have a class where they'd answered 15,000 questions over the, the course of one night, and then, uh, and then you'll see it go up even higher, and then back down to nothing. At first, I got really mad. I thought, oh, how can I change them? And then I thought, I don't have to change them, but I have information now into when they want to use that versus something else, or how I can change it. And so I think the idea, if I could change how this all works, that part of your teaching is you get your window into the students, uh, what they're doing outside of the classroom. With that data, finally, that's like formative assessment that I can use. And now in the classroom, I can even look, which are the questions that are revealing potential misconceptions, which, or this or that. Or if I want them in another class not to wait till the night before, there are things I can do, and, and with certain assignments I can watch, and oh, there, now I create little, little bumps. But the integration of 
data that will show you patterns that you cannot see just by looking at them or by talking to the students who will actually respond to you. It's, it's, it's much, much more effective sampling, I think, among other things. Um, so I know that there was a lot of discussion this morning about this, but the, the, one, the one thing that I really need to emphasize as a classroom teacher is that the digital divide is real. We all know that, and it's interesting that you use the word wired. What would you rewire? I would rewire so that everyone had you know, internet access, so that everyone had a device that was comparable to the device that we expect them to use in the classroom. So the same way that we see um, sort of a division in language, and there's a, you know, so many studies about students who are succeeding and how much language they got at home, um, you know, now we're in an era where you're seeing students who are succeeding in how much technology they have at home. Um, and, you know, in my classroom, I have six um, uh, Chromebooks. That's it, six Chromebooks for 190 kids a day that I teach um, that were given to me through donors choose, right? So it's not there. I take my students to the computer lab once a week. Um, and usually I'm assessing on the computer because I have a platform where I can do that and get the kind of uh, quick data. Um, so we're in the computer lab, but the stu most of my students are not using computers at home. If they have access to technology, it is uh, a parent's phone, which as we know is, even though you can look up the same information, is just a very, very much different experience in terms of learning. So um, the digital divide is real and pervasive. So that's, uh, you know, number one. Um, the other thing that I think we really need to move towards is having um, learning and assessment really sort of start to match up with how students are using technology. So it might not be that we get the same devices in all of our students' hands, but um, if a student is using a cell phone every single day, then the way that we are delivering information and the way that students are being assessed on information should match that. That could include things like on testing, being able to look up information, right? Right now, we just want a student to be able to memorize what we told them to memorize. Um, with our new testing, there's you know, a, a great deal of, of, of more depth there. So it's not just the rote learning piece anymore. And, and you know, we're all really happy about that. That's a good thing. Um, but at some point, um, students are going to be looking up information, right? That's the skill that we need more now than just the memorization piece. So our testing needs to go there, our assessment needs to go there, our, our learning needs to go there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I find if I had to rewire one thing, uh, for me, the thing that keeps me up at night, I, I would say is it boils down to student engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, as a teacher, you, you think that everybody is teaching the same way that you're teaching because you're in the classroom, the door is usually shut or half shut. And then as you get out, you start to realize that not all classrooms are created equal. And, and one of the things that in my, the last three or four years where I have an opportunity to literally visit hundreds and hundreds of high school and middle school classrooms was the utter lack of engagement. Mm -hmm. And if we think about a classroom, um, and I did this, I took a picture of one of our classrooms this year, and I showed a picture, uh, I did it in black and white, and I took a picture from 100 years ago, and I, and I said, you know, what's the difference? And, and, and other than, you know, maybe a few materials, there virtually, in many of our classrooms, there is virtually no difference than 100 years ago. That keeps me up at night. A uh, hundred years ago, we were driven, um, we changed our model of education based on business. Business really drove this idea that we had to figure out how to serve business. Now we're a hundred years later uh, and we're doing the same thing. Business is really trying to influence and drive the way we look uh, at how we're going to teach and why we're going to teach kids. Um, and if we go back to John Dewey a hundred years ago, we are just now, 100 years later, starting in some areas of California to implement these ideas of that it's not just about uh, you know, career orientation or college orientation, but it's the melding of both of these that's going to help our at-risk kids. Um, and I'm always surprised when I read John Dewey at how, like, I'm like, oh my god, we're just now getting to this. It's taken us 100 years. 
Um, but there is some hope there, I think, with uh, programs like linked learning is one opportunity for us to look at. So I, I want to talk just briefly about this idea of technology, though. Um, I do believe, like my colleagues, that technology has an important role in the modern classroom. Uh, however, technology, in my personal mind, can't drive our instruction. Our instruction has to be the driver of the technology. And what we see is like, and, and I hope there's nobody from LAOSD that was involved in the uh, technology program putting in our iPads. But what we saw there, um, it, was a, it was really laudable. But it really was technology driving the, the moment and not instruction. I think if we would have done it the other way, we would have had a lot more success. Thank you. I, I yeah. one, thing, one thing that occurs to me that I sh uh, it might be worth mentioning, I remember teaching at night, we were teaching uh, you know, people after, after they'd been there at work and these graduate students in systems engineering who wanted to know about uh, computer architecture and organization. So I, I would stop every now and then and said, now, I've just shown you this, or maybe building a half at or something like that. Said, Do you understand? Blank looks. I, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> Probably, please don't call on me. Please don't, I, whatever they're thinking. You know, they, they, they. So I said, does anybody understand this? And uh, the same blank looks. Now, now in, in higher education, I notice, and maybe it'll, it'll come down because these are cheap. Everybody's got a clicker. A uh, lot of clickers going on. They call it active education. I recommend it to you because then I could ask, did you anybody understand? Or here's, here's a problem. Uh, give me an answer. I can show them. And I, too, would learn how they're doing. So I think that's a, a very interesting movement. And, and those, those things are cheap. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, that, that is a technology that you know, we probably ought to be using more in our uh, classrooms. It could, it could go all the way down to the elementary grades. Perfect. Thank Can you. I also yeah. jump in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I wanted to say about our classrooms looking different now than they used to is that I think we all have this responsibility also to sort of educate the general public about what a classroom looks like now in the digital age. Um, when you see any sort of advertisement that shows a teacher and a classroom, I mean, once in a while they have the teacher leaning over the desk, you know, in that cute shot, you know, working with one student. But mostly it's teacher at the board and students in rows. Our parents believe that that's the way a classroom should look, right? Many of our administrators believe that that's the way a classroom should look. They walk in and they want to see people sitting in rows and they're quiet and they're writing. So I think, um, you know, as we move forward, that all of us who are in the education space have a huge responsibility to talk about what differences you should expect to see in a classroom, right? Some kids are over there on the computer. Some kids are sitting with the teacher doing something. Some kids might be, you know, working together in a small group, that kind of thing. But, um, but that's part of our charge, I believe. And I think building on that, those of you who are joining tonight for the screening of Most Likely to Succeed, you'll see those kinds of ideas come to life at High Tech High. I'm sure you're all familiar. I want to offer a small anecdote and then ask another question. I have a company, as I mentioned, that's working on replacing current standardized tests with tests that measure how people think instead of what they know, which has come up many times today because we see that there's a constant disconnect between standards that seem really reasonable and then the implementation of those standards by really two companies, Pearson and ETS, and occasionally there's something like the Smarter Balance Test, which are marginally better, but we're at this point where we have two methods for assessing humans at scale. We have multiple choice and we have essays. And the problem with both of those methods is they're completely reliant on reporting some kind of content as a proxy for measuring skills and abilities. And the question is, how do you take what a teacher does on a daily basis when they sit in a classroom and actually understand by observing and then getting to know students, the level of cognition? How do you make that something that's cheap, that's scalable, that's reliable, and that's predictively valid? And this came up when I was speaking at a conference, the Nueva School, if anyone's familiar, has a fantastic conference called ILC every two years. And I was listening to four members of the college board discuss the tragic climate of college admissions and the number of factors that they have to consider and optimize for when they're admitting students. They have to be needs blind, but they need to make sure that they have enough reliable endowment donors when they graduate so that the schools are sustainable. And I was like nearly in tears by the end of this ridiculous panel and I raised my hand and I said, look, if you guys can actually tell me that you would wake up every day and you would build the same ecosystem of standards and tests like the APs 
which just so everyone understands, the emperor has no clothes. The APs require understanding and earning 50 to 75%, depending on the test, of the possible points. And this is not fake data. This is actually from ETS and the College Board. They have a wonderful 100 plus page paper where you can go through and comb out performance scores on every AP test. Now on the most prolific tests, the English and the math tests, the average score is around a 2.5. Remember, to get a five, it's only 50 to 75% of the possible points on the test. That's like a C or a D in any subject at school. And we have kids getting around a two. So if our kids are absorbing 20%, say, on a good day of content in the core AP courses, what's the point of proliferating more content mastery through APs? And to that end, I think what we've come to understand here is the closer you can get to resembling the real world in the classroom, and the more closely that standards for what we expect people to look like upon graduation can mirror standards of what we expect people to look like in the workforce, the better an education system can serve not only our nation in aggregate in the future, but the students and their communities and their families in the present. But building on that concept, I want to push people to think beyond what the job market looks like today and what our students look like today. It's all dismal and depressing. But when we think about the future of work economy, and we're seeing this happen real time, by the way, in Spain right now, 40%, 50% youth unemployment, people under 25. And yet there are 5 million job openings that Spain is having to import skilled talent to fill. I mean, it just makes no sense. So when we think about Spain as a microcosm forecasting what could very well be the reality here in 20 years, given the rise of AI and machine learning, how do you go about imagining an education system of the future that's not just graduating kids who can read and write and do basic math, which they can't right now, but who can actually imagine and create and then go about implementing and inventing? Because what we've heard from Pedro and Jim this morning all these higher order thinking skills that we love to talk about, very few kids are learning, very few teachers are capable or at least prepared to teach, and no tests are testing. So what do we do when we think about the future of work? I'll, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> thank you, because I don't find it dismal at all. Maybe I'm seeing a different world Good. than you. Uh, Make us optimistic. I'm feeling, and, and a lot of it is because of technology. I've never been more excited about the, the mood and demeanor of my, my students and their educational experience uh, than, than ever before. And one of the, the things I believe is responsible for this is that when I first started out, uh, and again, this is my experience is at the college level, you have instructors uh, across all these different disciplines, and they are charged with giving some evaluation to their students. You have to, you have to give them a grade. And so they'd produce, they'd produce tests, and there are a variety of different types of tests you'd produce. But I remember I had to write tests, and I would write these, and, and I had a lot of them that I would work really hard on. And I'd think, God, this is a really good question. It gets <laughs> right at some important construct, or this is about transfer. Finally, when I you know, uh, met IRT, uh, much too late, I thought, wow, here I can actually find out some truth about these items. And I looked, and, and I read one, though, that had been like a favorite item, and I realized that everybody got it right. And then I, I looked at another one, and, and it had this horrible, horrible discrimination. The smart, smartest kids were always going wrong, and a lot of the, mm. the lowest performing students were getting it right. And you start looking at it, it's like, wow, oh yeah, you can game it this way, or there's an ambiguity. And so all of a sudden, I was getting the tools to write assessments that were getting at the issues that I want. And while it's very easy to write an item that tests uh, on your content knowledge, and a lot of people default to that because it, it is easier. It's not impossible. You can write spectacularly good and focused questions on, on transfer. And, mm -hmm. and to me, some of the most important things, take what you've learned. We've got a novel situation here, and would this be the proper manifestation of it? And so I feel like today, with this greater understanding of assessment, and not just a greater understanding, but more trickle of the assessment into the real world, that that, that is causing our ability uh, to increase for writing exams, assessment items that are going to measure the things that we think they should measure. Now the big caution, to me the thing that I wish 
we could, we could stop is that when you have companies that get involved in this and they're like, oh, you've got an adaptive quizzing engine. Well, you, know, you realize you're going to need 20,000 mm -hmm. items and we want to start selling it today. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's hard to write good items. You know, my wife is an expert at it, but even she's, you know, she can only produce <laughs> 10 a day max. <laughs> uh, and so they're like, yeah, but we, we have bids right. from four different uh, places uh, overseas. They can do in one place a dollar 16 an item, another's a dollar 13, but we're going to go with the one that's a dollar 11 per item. And they start treating it like a commodity. Yeah. Whereas I think the data that we're now getting says there is a true expertise to be we had in writing and, and vetting items. And so we have the tools, and I think it's, it's we're fighting against this long-held belief that tests are a waste of time and they're bad and blah, 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 because in many cases that was true. So we have to forget about it. It's like, guess what? We have capacities now we didn't previously have, and that's exciting. I can have exams now that are, are actually testing ideas that so, I want. So Jay, I want to push on this for one second because you have the unique distinction of sitting in the middle of the funnel. So we have an, a, a funnel that points down from ETS's $1 billion a year determining what everyone attempts to learn in K through 12, right? And then they come to you at UCLA and you have eager freshmen who have subscribed to the notion of the elite liberal arts education and it can be really great and they come to your class when they've decided not to concentrate in a science field, but they're told, hey, you still need to have some basic knowledge of the universe. And then they graduate and they go to an employer who looks at their SAT score and their college GPA and makes a determination by weighing Cornell versus UCLA or UCLA versus Santa Monica Community College and does some system of arbitrage and says, yes, if I hire this person, my ass will be covered if they don't work out. Or no, if I don't, you know, it's too risky, I need to leave them. When you think about your ability to generate assessments that test ideas and skills more so than stuff, what do you wish employers were asking for for your graduates? What expectations do you want them to hold? And what expectations do you want K through 12 systems to know that you expect of students when they come in beyond reading and writing? That's a given. What kind of thinking do you need your students to come in doing and to leave doing? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I, when I finished getting my PhD, I saw a flyer up and this management consultant company, McKinsey, <laughs> was, was hiring and, and I'd always heard, oh, they're like you know, the Harvard of management consultants and, and lots of smart people work there. So kind of on a whim, I thought, I'm gonna apply. Yeah, I, I wanted to go into academics, but I, they said the interviews are crazy. And I thought that sounds like fun, so I went. <laughs> and and you know everyone else who's you know being interviewed, their whole life has been building towards this. And I had long, crazy hair. You know, I said I wore a suit, but I went in, and and they started asking you these questions that were not content based. They really required thought. I I, I have nothing but respect for their their process because they wanted me to solve problems and they wanted me to explain how I was going through the steps to solve them. And as a model that doesn't rely on the specific content you got in college, but it relies on someone has taught you transfer, someone has taught you critical thinking, I thought that was really good. I have two tasks. I do, there's a whole bunch of biology that people need to learn, but they're in their attitudes about science and, and all that, as well as critical thinking and, yep. and that. So I, I hope that those are the things they will ask at the job interview. And they're part of mine, but they can't be be everything. But I'd be I'd be happy if that's how the world was. It's good news for my company in particular. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bootsy, do you have a, a thought? Yeah. So, a um, couple of thoughts, many thoughts. <laughs> um, one is that uh, in March I was at the uh, International Summit for the Teaching Profession in uh, Berlin. And that's where all of the secretaries of education from 23 countries and all of the union heads from 23 countries go and talk about what's happening with teaching around the world. Um, so I had the opportunity there to meet with some um, other educators, and particularly a conversation I was having with German educators who were saying, like, well, we're studying your system. We don't care that your scores aren't great. Like, we want to know what you guys are doing. You're, you're graduating kids who have self-esteem. You're graduating kids who think they can do anything. You, are, you have the most innovative country in the world, right? So these are the kinds of things I think that you're pointing towards. And I was telling one of them about how in my classroom every year, sometimes multiple times, I'll get students who 
come in and can't even sit in a chair, right? I'm in middle school. They come in, they can't even sit in a chair, they don't bring supplies, whatever. So I work with them and you know, talk to them and we work it out and within a couple of weeks they're sitting in their chair and then we work on you know, getting out your pencil and having paper every day and then we work through that before we ever finally get to math you know, somewhere down the line. And I was saying, you know, and I'm looking at these little victories every single day as these kids are growing as people. And the German educator was like, wow, like we would never look at it that way, right? Like we're all about just what that kid knows. And they were just really fascinated that, um, that we do take time to work on those soft skills and that we do um, care and consider it a victory for people to grow as people when they're in our classrooms beyond just as mathematicians and whatnot. Um, I do believe that our Smarter Balance test um, is trying to measure some of that stuff. Our math practices, uh, ever since I first heard about Common Core and being a math department chair, I was lucky, like right at the beginning, they pulled us all in and they said, like, we're gonna do this new thing. It's called <laughs> Common Core. And, you know, and they made a whole bunch of promises that sounded wonderful. And some of them are, you know, coming, slowly coming to fruition, some of them not so much. Um, but they said one of the things we're gonna be doing is measuring those things. And in math in particular, we have standards that are math practice standards, right? And so sometimes when I do, um, when I do work with other teachers and talk about the math practice standards, um, we talk about life practices, right? They're not just math practices, but um, making sense of problems, using tools properly, being precise with vocabulary and solving, um, you know, looking for patterns. All of these things are life practices. So I do believe that we are um, working towards what you're talking about, which is not just focused on that content, but actually trying to um, deliberately teach and deliberately measure. And I know Smarter Balance Test has um, those elements where we're asking students to communicate and explain, right? Those kinds of skills where we're, um, you know, getting a student to decide which tool is gonna to be the best tool to use to do the problem solving that they need to do. It's not just about the answer. Students can get points for, for making a good argument, even if the argument is about something that was wrong, right? They made the good argument, they explained. So I think that they're, um, you know, that this stuff is happening. And um, as our testing becomes more robust and we're able to really pinpoint, as you're saying, like when, when is a student's problem solving? When are students' life yeah. skills at the level that, that we would expect at this grade level? And not just when, you know, when are their calculations there? Right. Um, you know, and I think that headed. speaks to a, a, an idea that I introduced a couple weeks ago at an event. This idea that computers are good at two things. They're good at computing and they're good at logic. We've focused a lot on our kids being good at computing. Can they add, can they read, can they do the thing in the program? We focused a lot less on logic. Can they structure the program? Can they go back to first principles? And can they invent whatever sequence of programs should be run? And that's a much harder and higher order of thinking than what most tests and most schools are achieving now. So I'm gonna pause there and open it up for, for questions and we'll kind of facilitate as we go through. Don't everyone stand up at once. <laughs> personalization point of view. Yeah. I was thinking, how about inverting the triangle? Why not 26 teachers for one student? Because here's the thinking. If tomorrow, <clears throat> if I go out of the door and I get hurt, and you, you know, take me to the UCLA hospital, I'm not gonna have the same person who's looking at my pulse, who's operating on me, who's stitching me, and his, the and his theology. They're all very different people. So have you looked at that paradigm shift where one student has many teachers versus one-to-one? Oh, uh, well, that, that, I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to do, uh, we, we know that one tutor with one student is vastly superior to one tutor or one teacher with a, a classroom full of students. The students learn more, better, faster, and, and we don't do that because we can't afford it, except for some cases, you know, where we, in surgery or something like that, or in piloting an aircraft, we have to have one teacher per student. But. Uh, I, I think the, the, the issue here is it gets around to putting, uh, uh, using the intelligence that we can build into computers, which is limited. You know, they only know how to add, yeah. and they only, and, and they only, and it's just a bunch of switches anyways. But you can, 
you can pick problems uh, that uh, will specifically test things like uh, declarative knowledge, but also underlying reasoning, uh, because here's a problem you've never seen before, but you've had problems like this before, but you don't tell them that. And, and let's see how well you do. So I think uh, that, uh, uh, so I, I, I am uh, optimistic, let's say, about the application of this uh, technology. We got, you know, Harry O'Neill here who's been working at this forever. Ray Perez has, has got a whole program at the Office of Naval Research for doing that. Uh, but I'm getting at uh, another issue, which is that our students, it, you, this represents uh, K through 16 here. Well, here I am. I don't do anything in K through 16. You know, I do, uh, we, we deal with the, the uh, recruits, particularly the uh, enlisted recruits in, in the military. And so that's a very different matter in some ways. Uh, that we don't have to worry so much about uh, motivation. <laughs> the, the, the services have ways to motivate these folks. Uh, believe me, I've been there. And, uh, and, and, and we, you know, we both have similar backgrounds, I suspect. But uh, so uh, there's that. But they, 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 it's a funny deal because in this case, the, 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 uh, the, the work that happens uh, and, and the, the, the uh, driving behind it comes from the computer, not from the, the human teacher. Mm -hmm. Because in that case, uh, they're, uh, you, know, you have mo uh, monitors around, you know, people who are keeping an eye on things, and, and also they, uh, and, and they're, to some extent, a lot of these systems have language recognition and they're good, but they're not perfect. So you have to have people around to help with that. And then, of course, in the Navy, you want people who can tell sea stories. In the Army, you want people who can tell war stories, because that's a big part of the, their learning. But uh, by and large, they're, 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 the, 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 the initiative, the teaching, the control over the uh, presentation of the curriculum is, is in the computer. Uh, and, and that seems to work very well. Uh, you know, we've, we've, had, we've trained a bunch of veterans at one point. Uh, uh, we had 100 of them in. And of the 100, uh, 90, uh, all but two uh, finished the course. These are people who were on the street before. They, they applied to this course and, then, and they came in. Well, how well did they do when they went out to try a job? Well, in, in jobs, you, you speak to the, the, in this case, is information technology, you speak to people who are going to quiz you about various situations that come up in, in, in troubleshooting these systems. Uh, these kids, uh, uh, I say kids, all right, they're 20, you know, mid-20s or something. Look, everybody's a kid to me, for Pete's sake. <laughs> so, okay, so, they, so they, they, they would go out and get jobs at basically a systems administrator two, which means it's a job that's given to people with three to five years prior experience. Their experience consisted of 18 weeks taking this course. So we have, we have powerful capabilities uh, 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 within our grasp uh, uh, we need to get them in our hands. Uh, so there, I don't know if this answers your question, but there's, uh, uh, I, I think the, app, the use of AI, uh, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence in this business, uh, it, uh, is, it, it, it's got a long ways to go, yes. Uh, and there's a lot of snake oil being sold out there as uh, intelligent tutoring systems, an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, some of these systems are very good and they point to a future that uh, uh, is, is promising. Don, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I, I don't want to sound like a Luddite, but I'm going to go low tech on my answer <laughs> here. Um, I, I think it's an interesting idea, and I think we really, in some ways, are trying to do that. I think that the, at the crux of this is interdisciplinary teaching. Currently, and for 100 years, we've taught in isolation. Today, you're going to learn math, because you need to learn math. Today, you're going to learn English, because you need to learn English, history, et cetera. And this idea of coming together in interdisciplinary learning and creating an engagement that None of us, once we leave school, typically learn anything in isolation. We usually learn it in, in context of a, of a larger system. So bringing teachers together uh, to teach interdisciplinary units, project-based learning where kids are actually doing, learning by doing, which is what most of us, almost all of us do, um, I think is a really, is one way that we are really trying to move our education. The problem, and I'm gonna speak to any budding administrators out there, is that to do that as a teacher in isolation is incredibly difficult, and the systems we have in place don't allow teachers the time or the energy or the effort to be able to do that. So as administrators, one of, I believe, one of my main goals is to create the conditions, not just of learning, but the conditions of rich teaching. So teachers have schedules 
that allow them to do this kind of interdisciplinary work, getting together. They have to have time. Currently, they're in their classroom for six hours a day, and then they're given you know, 45 minutes to plan and 30 minutes to eat lunch. That is not the conditions for this kind of, of learning. So when we start, we have to look holistically. But I agree that it is not just one teacher uh, per student, but it is, a, it, it is bringing that together in interdisciplinary ways. So to synthesize both of your points, and then I don't know where Deborah is, if we have time for one more question. I think the things that we're hearing are AI can be a helpful tool in aggregating the minds of many in one computational device instead of actually many. And two, from Dawn's perspective, there's a difference between reorienting the end goal of a system around project-based learning or adaptive learning or whatever type of learning you want to embrace as the cornerstone of your school and tacking it on as another expectation on top of whatever else you're already doing that surely you can't afford to experiment with because it's working so well as dictated by all of your admissions scores. Right, but there's the same kind of logic that prevails in hedge funds that are saying, is it worth the 20% increase on my return to take this moonshot versus just holding at my status quo? And we have the same calculation happening on a micro level every day in every role across the system. So how we go from achieving iterative change of having one project-based period or one lab period a week to flipping everything and saying, instead of running you through an assembly line that was really devised for, to your point, an early 1900s manufacturing-based economy, how do we recognize that the job market students enter look nothing like that? And we need to radically shift our expectations for teachers, our support for teachers, our expectations for class time, and our structure of administration across our school system at all levels. Deborah, do we have time for one more question? Can I don't know where she is. Yeah. Cool, uh, one more question. Sorry, I can't get up. There's a place for uh, the AI, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, we have to develop uh, a collaborative nature among our teachers. In the meantime, we don't have, you don't, you have six Chromebooks. So accessing a computerized. There is this, and it's, I worked at the University of Virginia with Carol Tomlinson on differentiation. So I'm wondering, uh, part of that is based on, we want to get at skills, but it's answering these essential questions, getting at the big concepts. So I throw it out to everybody, but Bootsy, I'm, because you're <laughs> in the trenches, mm -hmm. that here you had small victories getting those life skills in there. So how do you handle when they come in student needs? I don't know what level math you teach, but they're, they're not near ready for what your content is. So is there a way in which you differentiate or help them uh, individualize or at least in groups uh, help them gain those skills and those big ideas? Yeah, sure. So. Um, definitely groups are, are a huge part of my instruction. Um, and uh, the computing is really great for that. So even those six Chromebooks, if I can get the right kids working on the right skills on those six Chromebooks while other students are doing other things, then, then that's great, right? Um, really, so I'm teaching middle school math, you didn't know what level, uh, middle school math, which is uh, seventh and eighth and also an Algebra One course. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's about the grouping. I have kids, you know, I have classes that are 40 kids and, and none less than 30. So, you know, we're, we're working together and uh, to the many teachers, one student, I think, you know, student, uh, the other students can be those other teachers to, uh, to those students. So we're working in groups quite a bit um, where uh, if students need extra help, they come up with me, we're working at this table, right? If students feel like they can do it with their peers, they're working over here. If students feel like they're soaring, they get that differentiated work to take them to the next level, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't know if that's the answer that you're looking for, but. It is. As their graduation comes in, how mm -hmm. do we do it? So, mm -hmm. yes, I like technology, but at the same time, the teacher in the classroom mm -hmm. can make those judgments about what needs to be done and when mm -hmm. you need to do what. 
and there's really um, a piece about the professional learning that also needs to happen, um, you know, as we move forward. Um, to get out of that cemetery row. To, to get out of the cemetery row, and also, um, you know, to share resources and um, just for for every teacher to be able to break kids up and say, you know, we're going to work on this thing and you're going to work on that thing and make it happen. It's, you know, it is a lot of planning. It's a lot of years of figuring out how to make it work and, and yeah. yeah. Can, can I say <laughs> something? Yeah. That the part where the, I think, computerized technology and adaptive quizzing can help there is, is that there still can be a ton of stuff you need to do. So as an example, I might have set some mastery level and you need to achieve this level uh, in order to be in, in a good place. And I'll look and some students will, will require six or seven hundred questions, you know, 40 quizzes and others might only require about a hundred questions to get there. And, and that's tough to do in your classroom but it can, it can squeeze in the variance a yeah. little bit while at the same time as the instructor, when I look and I see what their level is, if there is some normal distribution of abilities or proficiencies with something, that helps me because I can't hit all of, all of it at once. And I have to decide, all right, I think the, the top quarter, they're probably gonna be okay without me. The bottom 15% may not be as efficient for me, but if I can shoot here for the 25th to 60th percentile or something like that, that information can make what I do in the classroom, regardless whether it's groups or something else, much more effective by targeting it. So I still think the data, you know, it can, it can help bring people up, but it can still also tell me, here's where you gotta aim. And as teachers, most of us in that normal distribution, we were right at the end. And yeah. so our ability to model the head of a kid who's at the 30th percentile is terrible. We're selected because we're not that. And, and so it helps to, to actually have some objective data that says, you, you, you got to aim in a different place. Yeah. All right, I think we are probably out of time. Thank you all for your comments and thanks for good questions.